Hey Great. guys, welcome. Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the podcast where we get the folks that are focused on transforming the future and how we all think about it. I think this guy's definitely doing that. We've got Auke Ispirt on the program. I'm doing my best to pronounce the name, but we'll see what we can do. Thanks for coming today, Auke. Great. I'm very happy to join. So I, I came into touch with your work from TED and this massive robotic salamander. And that's kind of where I want to start. Can you quickly give me an overview of your background and how you got into all this? Yeah, so well, it's a long story, but I, I was trained as a physicist, but then I got very fascinated by animal locomotion. And during my PhD, I started modeling the spinal cord of, of animals, making neural network models. And then later, I got more and more interested in robotics. So see, use a robot as a tool to understand animal locomotion. And here, the salamander story basically started by that, where I was interested in swimming and walking. And the salamander is a wonderful animal capable of doing the transition from swimming. And a very key animal from evolution point of view, the transition from aquatic to terrestrial uh, locomotion. Basically, we all kind of evolved from salamander. So you can see a little bit of this is where animals this is where everything came from exactly yeah the salamander is almost a living ancestor of of all tetrapods all terrestrial um, animals and including mammals and humans of course yes absolutely yeah that's really interesting so i did not know i was descended from salamanders that's uh <laughs> that, we you learn you learn something new every day so basically your your background you were interested in animals and how they move trying to understand the body and the best way you thought to do that was Let's build a robot and see if we can do it. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, my field now of biorobotics is uh, it's a very exciting field. I think it's it's um, very interdisciplinary, and it has two missions. One, indeed, um, is is first of all the engineering mission is to take inspiration from animals to make robots that move better in difficult environments. But the other mission, which I like a lot, is the use of robots as to test hypotheses about animal locomotion. And a robot can be basically a wonderful scientific tool to investigate animal locomotion, test hypotheses, and, and work with neuroscientists and biomechanics people to, to understand animal locomotion. How do you think about biological evolution versus mechanical evolution? Um, yeah, good question. So, so um, uh, yeah, for me, evolution is a wonderful way of creating things. So uh, uh, I think the um, evolution in, in biology is basically uh, has been a very good way of exploring different possibilities to move around, survive and, and do better. And, and in mechanics, we also do iterations. It's cl clearly different, but we do also do iterations to little by little improve mechanical concepts or control concepts by improving previous, um, previous uh, ideas. And what what's the optimization function? What are we what are we headed towards? Are we trying to build robots that function perfectly like animals? Are we trying to steal evolution's best characteristics and build even better robots? What's the what's the end game? Mm, ah, it's hard to know the end game, but of of course, um, well, one important thing about biology uh, biological evolution is it doesn't try to optimize anything. It tries just to be good enough. And survive, and and surprisingly, that concept has been very powerful to to generate many types of animals, many types of moving around. So so um, in robotics, maybe the same. We should not try to be optimal in any sense, but indeed be good good enough to survive and and um, to be good enough for a set of of applications. Uh, clearly, robots will be more applied to have maybe some some application to solve, and and you want to be good enough at doing those and and be. Uh, at the same time, agile and adaptive to to uh, tackle new problems that may be given to to the robot. What do you What do you see as like the most disruptive early fields for robotics? Where will we start to see robotics really come into play more so than just the robotic arms we have now in factories? And then when will bio mimicking robots start to start to play a bigger role? Yeah, it's true that um, so far the big success of robotics has been in uh, industrial robotics, Sing places where you have to be repetitive and very accurate. Robots are ideal, and that's why we need robots to make our cars, like to have factory lines completely uh, automated and thanks to very accurate and, and precise robots. I think the next challenge where maybe biorobotics can play a role is, is when you have to interact with more complex environments and if you have to interact with humans, because their uh, environments will not be as geometrical, as clean as in a factory. 
uh, it will be noisy environments, it will be changing over time, it will be uh, a bit messy with grass, sand, rocks. And these are really where animals are better than current robots. And uh, even more when you interact with humans, uh, uh, a man an industrial robot is really a dangerous machine. That's why they are in cages. And uh, if you want to interact with humans, it's good to be a bit animal-like with a bit softer, compliant behavior, uh, soft behavior, and, and adapt uh, adaptation to what the human does. So I think to answer your question, I think biorobotics will play roles in when you have complex environments and when you have humans in the environment. And there, I think being bio-inspired can be a plus compared to more traditional robotics. Bio-inspired is often super valuable. My background is mechanical engineering, so I, I really wanted to get into the biomimicry courses. I couldn't because they were full. But it can also, it doesn't always work. So we don't know how a honeybee flies. And if you try to scale up a hummingbird to, to build some type of flying vehicle, the, 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 the dimensions, it just doesn't quite work out. How do you think about where to look for different animal and evolutionary type adaptations that we can take from versus the ones that may not be as helpful or may not work? Yes. Yeah, so, so I think, first of all, um, we have to look at principles rather than uh, ready-made solutions. So clearly evolution led to uh, creatures that uh, that had to adapt to many things and and there's a whole history of changes that make animals for instance not optimal in terms of locomotion you can't probably do take some um, some key principles and do better uh, because also uh, animals have many constraints that a robot might not need to have like to grow from a few cells to something big and to reproduce to eat to have a metabolism so in terms of robotics, I think there are a few key principles we want to re replicate and have in our robots. And the rest we can just get not, not try to replicate uh, exactly. That, there's there, therefore both a bit difference between biomimicry, where you really want to copy exactly, and bioinspiration, where you take some key ideas and, and replicate them in robots. And from an engineering point of view, I think it's, that's very important. Just see what's good and just use that, not the rest. And you're working primarily in biomimicry or bio, bio, um, the, the, the first one? Bio inspiration. Yeah, it depends on the project. So, so my engineering applied projects. So we, we have some projects, for instance, where we want to do search and rescue or, or pollution monitoring. There, we just want bio inspiration. Use some idea, uh, interesting properties from animals and imply, implement them in robots. But we don't need to be too close. In other projects, it's a bit close to biomimicry because there we, let's say for the, the salamander robots that we have developed for understanding the functioning of the spinal cord in, in, in vertebrate animals, there it was important to be quite close in terms of the biomechanical properties and, and the general properties of the body. So there we were quite careful uh, using X-ray videos of salamanders, carefully characterizing the mass distribution, uh, the interaction force with the environment. There we want to be close and, and mimic more the, the animal properties. So I would say uh, biomimicry is important for scientific questions and by inspiration more for the engineering applications. Okay, so theory and, theory and practice. What do, you, mm -hmm. what do you see as the most interesting or cutting edge things happening right now in, in all of robotics, not necessarily just what you're working on, but the stuff that you hear or see on the fringes. Yeah, so so there are many exciting things happening. Um, so I would say industrial robotics has been a success story. Autonomous cars, which for me are, are part of robots with sensors, actuation and control loops, I think is also start to be a success story. Uh, I'm very impressed by anything happening coming out of Boston Dynamics, all these legged robots uh, that do more and more impressive, agile movements. I think these are really good success stories. And um, the whole field of drones, flying robots has exploded, many very interesting use of drones. Yeah, so we start to see several success stories. And uh, I would say the field of biorobotics has still to prove itself a bit more than other fields. But I think we, we see nice, cool things happening in robotics. How much of the, the Boston Dynamics stuff is a highlight reel versus this is what's consistently happening? I know if you watch, if you watch an athlete, maybe they'll take a half-court shot 100 times and they'll hit it twice. Is that where we see these backflips happening and these crazy, these crazy things? Or is this something where they're at this level and this this level is not going backwards. 
Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So, so uh, we in, in academia we have a bit of love and hate relationship with Boston Dynamics in the sense that they uh, we love them because they add a lot of visibility to the type of robotics we love and we want to do, and, and they're really top, the state of the art. The, the hate aspect is that they're quite uh, secretive, so they, they don't display, they don't share any of the control algorithms. We, we don't know how many trials they made to get the videos. And, and um, Mark Rabert is quite honest in his plenary talks when he gives at robotics conference that is so Mark Rabert is the leader of, of Boston Dynamics, that what they show is really the best results. And, and there are many failures that they don't show. And um, yeah, th this relationship between academia and Boston Dynamics is a bit unfair because we, we publish openly, we, we have our papers open, they hire people from our, us, and in return, they only provide some videos. So my own impression is that they, they're really good. Um, the big challenge is to be uh, very, maybe more generic. I think they, the videos are really the result they made for that specific ground, the specific height. Everything is kind of optimized to have a backflip from that specific point to reach there. So the challenge, the next challenge for them and for us as well is to be more generic, that you you provide a completely new environment and 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 have then this agility, these jumps and all that. And and I think there's good progress, but that's I think the next step to be much more generic, not like just for one video, one nice result. It's like the parrot that you can train to say Polly want a cracker, but it doesn't know how to talk. It just is optimized for that one one specific thing. How how soon before before you think we have more not not artificial general intelligence, but more generally adaptive robots? They're able to handle more circumstances. It's not like the Roomba that's like dush, 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 into the wall. It's able to really really do a good job with adapting to surroundings, to to taking action, to optimizing for what it what it's meant to optimize for even when the circumstances are new yeah yeah so indeed the big challenge is this notion of general intelligence that you mentioned that that, that like a bit the just the logic or, or or things like that that we the common sense aspect of intelligence that's still not there completely uh, or quite far the other challenge is is this kind of body intelligence which personally i find very fascinating and i think we completely underestimate in animals so uh, for us it's very natural to walk we don't think about it but our nervous system and especially spinal cord solves an amazingly complex control problem and i think there are still many things to be better understood on this interaction between all the components that need that do locomotion so the the sensors but also the biomechanical properties of muscles the interaction forces um, there's a whole kind of level of intelligence of the body um, that makes animal amazingly agile and and in fact it's very rare to see an animal staying stuck because they they are able to use many muscles many ways of moving around so i think we're making progress in, in trying to mimic those properties but i think there's still lots of things to do to to handle your own whole body properly and and the other big challenge is also anticipate uh, animals are good at and especially humans at uh, doing anticipatory behavior an anticipate things so and that is complex because then you're not only reactive to the environment but you have a kind of a model of the environment to to plan things in advance and that is a big challenge how how to create a model that's of the environment that's good enough so that you can plan and do imagine movements before doing them and explore which one is best and then implement that this aspect of of yeah anticipation is is very complex so you think we're still we're still a far ways off from from an anticipation based um system yeah i think we make good progress how i see it is is uh <laughs> it's a bit like maybe with artificial intelligence you 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 always see like um the horizon going further so each time you think okay now if i reach this i have solved it and we can move on to something else then we have a big milestone but each time we reach something then we discover oh there are so many more things we can we should do as well uh to be able to be really autonomous like animals so it's a bit a receding horizon problem that that you you reach something but then you discover there's still many more problems that you didn't know and that you discovered then that you have to solve is it a fractal? Will it always get more and more complex? Is it something that's impossible to solve, but you continuously get pulled deeper and deeper into? No, uh, yeah, at, uh, no, I, I think we will find a solution. Like, like uh, animals do it. So we, we, by improving our technology, 
uh, asymptotically. I don't know how, how rapidly we'll raise and, and, and when we'll start to, to have a plateau. We, we will reach it, but it takes more time. I think most people underestimate the time to, to reach it. Than, than, and maybe the, the field of robotics suffers a bit from overselling as well, that, that people said, okay, we're reaching that in 10 years. Uh, but people have been saying that for, for many times, 10 years. So I think, yeah, there's a bit of overselling that, that, that is a problem. It's because they need the funding. If you, you, yeah. if you run out after 10 years, I know I was just talking to a leading neuroscience expert and she was saying that they have this stat. Um, people have always said you use 10% of your brain, which is actually bullshit. You use all of your brain. But if you look at the conscious versus the unconscious in terms of what your body's doing, maybe your conscious thoughts might be 1% of what's happening, most of it's subconscious. And I think mm -hmm. I think that subconscious applies as well to action. So for, for robotics, for b animal beings, we don't actually know what's going on. Our body just kind of does it. And the just kind of does it part is what, what robots are missing right now. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's it's very well well said. Yeah, especially because the the nervous system is made of so, so many layers. So starting from the spinal cord, the brainstem, the cerebellum, the motor cortex, there are many layers of the brain that can solve the same problem and, and they, it's very redundant. So that's also why it's so robust. So you may have failure somewhere, but then another part layer can take over uh, and it's very rich, all these layers and understanding how it works is hard and, and um, it's fascinating as, at the same time. So you're kind of at the, at the overlay of AI and, and mechatronics to or mechanical engineering to some extent. How closely are you interacting with AI researchers? What's the what's the interactions look like there? Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm really a bottom up person. So I'm really close to the mechanics, to 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 the fast sensory motor loops, to the spinal cord, let's say much more than the motor cortex if if you take the in, uh, nervous system organization. And and um, yeah, the, the it's a bit I haven't had so much links with more traditional AI, but that's exactly, I think, this problem of anticipation where here there's, a, I think, very nice links to create by people who do more reactive architectures, who are more uh, focused on, on agility and locomotion, to link these people like me with people who are able to do learning, reinforcement learning, supervised learning, uh, modeling, planning, anticipation. Uh, because these are different skills. You get more from analog to di digital, from, from uh, yeah, uh, quantities to symbols. Uh, linking these two worlds um, is, is starting for me now. I, I would say now, I, for instance, I, I submit a new project funding, getting fun, trying to get funding for, for this notion of anticipation above the spinal cord, how animals are able to, to adjust the step length when they run to step over and jump over stones. These are things where you need a model of the environment and, and able to, to predict. And that's clearly more an AI problem than a motor control problem. So uh, I would say there, everything that happens also in deep learning uh, can help because that can help to create this internal model of your own body, of the spinal cord and of the environment. There are many li links to create there. And then the whole big field of planning, uh, how to find the fastest solution in a maze uh, this is typically things you would need as, as well on top of the type of control architectures we develop for locomotion. So that's the next project for you. Where uh, where do you think that'll lead to? Yeah, my dream would be to, I think we now in the lab have several success stories of, of robots that can swim, walk, do transition between modes. But indeed for me, uh, my dream would be to to have a robot that, that that is that does a bit what Boston Dynamics does, like this jumping around, backflips, things like that, uh, uh, with a very big robustness, so that you give a new terrain and very rapidly you can you can plan this robust locomotion and do things that require this anticipation and this model of the environment uh, and the world that you need. How do you think about robots in war? Because that sounds like a super soldier, and we talked about drones a little earlier. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's a field which I find scary, and and uh, I'm very happy to have only civilian projects. I, 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 one of the reasons I'm 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 in the, in Europe rather than in, in the US, where I know that you have to get more defense-related money to do robotics here. Everything is civilian, and I want to keep it that way. At the same time, I'm not naive. Indeed, as you said, many of these things can be uh, have military applications uh, uh, very rapidly. 
And here, I think, as a field of robotics, we have to be a bit careful because I think one thing we should really try to avoid is make uh, war uh, like a video game where, where the richest country just send out robots and see this as a video game, do it remotely. And the human cost will always be enormous for the less technology-oriented um, people and, and for the place where the war will take place. So the whole field of uh, robots for military application, I think, is quite scary. And, and there, I think, as roboticists, we we should think careful, very carefully of what we're doing. And, and um, I think there are some boundaries that we should not cross. I think so, and yet someone will cross them. How do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. Uh, it will, um, yeah, it will, it it might, it will, yeah, it will happen. Yeah, it it's it it. Yeah, I find it a bit scary, and I know that my research I publish openly. I'm, I'm uh, people could replicate, let's say, our salamander robot and and use it for applica uh, military applications. Yeah, I I I think at some point this should be a, a society level. Agreement. I think you you have a bit the the Geneva Agreements of War. Uh, I think these are things that at the at international level we should have agreements and laws and 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 really make sure you you you're not allowed to sell these some of these mechanisms or something. Yeah, I'm I, I'm a bit naive, but I think this is really a society level thing that we should organize. No, I think definitely. I'm actually reading a I'm reading a great sci-fi book by Ian Banks. But in one of the scenes, there's two different species meeting, and they're they're talking about war and how how terrible it is. And then you realize they're running it all as a simulation. They no longer have war because it's just too terrible to think about. So they perfectly simulate everything and basically play chess while playing war while destroying each other civil civilizations in virtual reality it was a okay. it, was an, it was an interesting concept but that would be a good solution yeah, yeah. No, it would be a great solution the problem is yeah. if you lose you might still actually play the game but in terms of where we're headed what what do you see on the cutting edge for for exoskeleton technology so let's say i want to be iron man maybe not flying but how far are are we off from something like that where it doesn't look like i'm wearing a massive uh, a forklift essentially but relatively functional exoskeletons what's cutting edge and where are we 10 years from now yeah um so so the field of exoskeletons is moving quite rapidly in in academia at least and then where things are much slower uh, as far as i know is to get certification and and uh, ha have this accepted by uh yeah by insurance to be covered and and things like that so i think the the, the reason why Exoskeletons are not as as common as we would hope. is is mainly for yeah this lack of certification and very expensive hardware that's not yet reimbursed by insurances. But indeed, the progress is is I think moving nicely. Uh, there are many exoskeletons on the market. Uh, they also start to be interesting kind of soft or cable driven solutions that are more lightweight. Uh, here at EPFL or uh, in Zurich, there are people working on this wearable robot that with soft actuation. Connor Walsh at um, Harvard as well ha has this kind of principle. And um, these robots are mainly used for assistance. So, so for really people who need it and have a, a locomotion disability, spinal cord injury, stroke. It's sometimes used for augmentation, but there I think the except if you carry very big loads you you nobody has really made been able to make to make an exoskeleton that makes you run better i think so far you still run much better without it than with an exoskeleton so i think the main application that we'll see is for really restoring locomotion for people who have none or almost none there the benefits are enormous and then for augmentation that will probably take quite some more time what's quite some more time and do you work with uh do you work with the bmi the brain machine interface people at all uh, no, not myself. The, I have colleagues like Josie Milan at EPFL who, who does EEG interfacing to wheelchair and, and also I think to some exoskeletons. Um, yeah, I would say maybe the next uh, 10, 20 years we'll, we'll see um, exoskeleton being more widely used. And for sure, the first the first market for me is, is for spinal cord injury uh, patients. and and having people to move part of the time or maybe all of the time out of wheelchairs. 
um, augmentation is is maybe the first application. Yeah, one is the military, military, but the other one might be factory workers. I know that uh, many works are, are require like handing uh, heavy power tools above your head and that you can maybe do for a few minutes. If you have an exoskeleton, you could easily support that and work like maybe double or triple the time of, of, of workers. There, I think you, you might find uh, for some factory lines, um, workers having augmentation and probably kind of not general purpose, but sp quite specific to the, the type of tools and, and tasks you have to solve. What are your favorite sci-fi books or movies? What inspires you and helps you think outside the box? Yeah, I, I, uh, I there are many science fiction uh, movies and and uh, that I like. I, I, Blade Runner is a favorite. Uh, <laughs> for me, there's this dream. You, you know the scene where Harrison Ford enters this shop, and he, they're all kind of animals in that shop. And he asks, uh, are these real animals? And, he, and the shop owner says something like, uh, oh, no, these are just robots. It would be too expensive if, if these were real robots. For, for me, I like this scene as a, as a dream, as a bioroboticist. If I had that level of, of realism, I would be super happy. It's a bit sad that animals are too expensive. <laughs> That's a bit scary part. But at least the realism uh, I love from, from uh, um, Blade Runner. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, there are many, many cool scientific uh, science fiction books. Uh, I, I, yeah, I like the, the space opera things a bit like The Expanse, uh, but that's more for entertainment. Um, uh, there was this interesting Chinese science fiction guy, um, The Three Body Problem or something. Uh, science fiction book written by a Chinese writer. Very interesting, quite quite deep, hard science fiction that I liked. Um, I heard about that. That's like the second time in two days someone referenced that. I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, I should think about it a bit more. These are no things worries. that just come do, to mind. So, yeah. Do you worry about the Uncanny Valley at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's um, it's an interesting thing um, because I, I notice a similar. Well, I, I'm, I'll notice a bit the opposite effect in in my robots in the sense that um, well, I think one thing we, we we find out is the fact that and it's related to the uncanny value is the fact that motion is much more important than appearance. Um, in the sense that uh, some of our robots, when they move, they really look animal-like, and when you stop them. These are just set of boxes. And I like this. I almost like to play with that because some of what well, we, we made, one of our robots was made for, for the BBC um, Spy in the Wild series, this documentary where they make uh, robot animal-like robots to approach real animals. So we make a crocodile robot for that. And there the skin was amazingly realistic, made by uh, specialists in London. And, and there, in that, that case, the appearance was very good and the motion was pretty OK. Uh, in another robot, we have the appearance, which is really not nothing, but the motion is realistic, and these are the ones which really look lifelike. And so, uh, in terms of motion, it's interesting how um, yeah, the motion is much more important than the appearance, and that's probably what explains the uncanny valley, where where you have the appearance, which is pretty good, but the lip movements and the, the all the, the yeah the motion, the the eye contact is is not there. And it's probably because we are used to, to, we are very, our eyes are very attracted by motion, things that move uh, more than appearance. And body language is a huge, a huge part of communication. How the animals, exactly. rea how the animals react when you had robots moving around uh, with them? Yeah, so, so uh, we were a bit disappointed in, in that documentary in the sense that the, um, we could not have close contact. So, so the, the crocodile robots were, the, cro the real crocodiles already always going away when we try to approach with our uh, cro uh, robot device. So the best footage they had in that series was just with fixed cameras they had along uh, around the, the crocodiles. And that was another shooting that the one we were involved in. So first, it was mainly an exercise to make a very realistic-looking animal. And, and uh, we learned a lot by being on the field, like very hot conditions. Everything was quite difficult. So we learned a lot in terms of robot design. Uh, but the interaction with the animal was, was not as we had hoped.
Do you think the the animals have the same deal, the uncanny valley, where it kind of feels similar, but it's weird enough that this is creepy and I need to get away immediately? Oh yes, yeah. That's a bit, we were dreaming for kind of interaction between the re the real crocodile and our robot, and for sure, I, I think the just the smell and the noise and everything it will probably have been looked at a very scary zombie or some strange thing for the for the real animal. Though, so for sure, yeah, mainly maybe the smell and and many things. I think we. I'm not sure to what extent it's easy to to fake it with a with a real animal uh, because they can't they can't abstract away and think about something else as a different living creature. They, they don't have the concept of robot, so by not having that, it is just even weirder. I imagine. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There could be, and and I think people did it. Like like um, <laughs> the the one place where you could have maybe interesting interactions with robots and animals is is was like di little ducks. Like you, I think little ducks. The first thing they see, they believe it's their mom, and and uh, so you have many stories where little ducks follow I don't know a dog or a cat and and think it's their mom, and they get attached to it. So there you could probably <laughs> maybe trick a uh, little dog when it uh, when it raises to to believe a robot is is its mom um just because it's it just it's the only thing it knows basically so there, there could be things to do there yeah it's the nature it's the nature and nurture i know we're we're planning to go there's a wildlife reserve around here and for a while it was the only one in the world they have a bear a lion and a tiger that all live together are friends and are in the same cage and they just grew up together and that suddenly you have lions and tigers and bears oh my but they're totally cool with it and that's mm -hmm. uh, that's not normal but it's it's interesting how yeah. how yeah your surrounding impacts that how do you think about how do you think about the future of work and automation jobs robot taxes universal basic income what are, what are your thoughts on the overall matter yeah so so and, uh, indeed i think we are in a transition stage where we will have more and more robots um, doing jobs and and um, and I understand a bit this, that some people might be scared that for sure there will be some jobs disappearing, but there will be new jobs appearing. And uh, this whole field of cobots, uh, co-workers, where, where the human will be in charge of a bit the, the flexibility and creativity, and the robot will be there to do a bit more the repetitive task and, and have some kind of tandems between a human and a robot, I think that can be very powerful. So for, for small factory lines that are very easy to reconfigure and things like that. So I think production will come back much more to Western countries, thanks to that. Um, uh, so I think many jobs will be created thanks to that. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think the robots, I think there will always be new jobs. So, so this notion of just staying lazy at home, uh, getting some income and having robots to everything, I think that will never happen. And personally, I would be super bored. So I, I, I'm happy to do some hobbies, to go around, but at some point I want to work. So I, I think people will find new jobs where where there's a very smooth interaction between workers and robots, let's say. That's, that's a bit my vision. Even if we achieve artificial general intelligence? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, because the... Um, there will always be specialists or, or, or robots being better at some things and we as, as better at some things. Even among humans, there we many people specialize. Some are very good with hands, some are very good at thinking, some are very athletic. Uh, it will be the same. I think there will be a diversity of, of intelligence and, and capacities. And I, I would not be surprised if we'll have some kind of hybrid society, mixed uh, humans, mixed robots. And, and hopefully a smooth interaction. Any idea on a timeline, time horizon? When do we see the C3PO of the future? Yeah, th this, this I think is is maybe a bit further than we think. Again, because robotics has been overselling a bit, so there are some success stories, but it's always in a very kind of uh, specific case. Uh, I would say fifty years, so not before fifty years. Will you live to see it? Oh, I, well, I'm 47. I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I hope so too. You, you've got yeah. you've got some good work ahead of you. I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. And um, yeah, I think we we have a bit of duty to to make sure this transition is smooth. So so I, I understand the worries of of some people a bit worried to lose their jobs. So I think that's 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 an important worry. I 
I think the worry would be more in in um, developing country or country that are really making big production, uh, China and others. Uh, I think in Western countries we. On the opposite, I think we'll see more production coming back to be here than locally, which also from an uh, ecological point might be bad, bad, better to have everything done more locally. So I think this can be done smoothly, but we have to think and do it carefully. Otherwise, it can be big, yeah, a bit, it can be chaotic. Yeah. Does it worry you? One thing that I notice is with researchers, with scientists, with university types, they're almost always hopelessly optimistic. This technology will just be used for good. Everything will be great. Facebook will solve the world's problems. When you have technologists, oftentimes they don't think about the downsides because that's what their research is. They're there to envision and create the future. And you can't do that if you're a pessimist. Do you, do you worry about that at all or see that in in university settings, et cetera, scientists that aren't necessarily considering the implications of their work. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. We we often naive and and over optimistic. So you're absolutely right that this is something where uh, sociologists, um, yeah, many people should be involved. Politicians, um, to some extent, uh, journalists, many people should be involved to to think about it and and. Uh, Everybody should think about it, not only uh, technologists, of course. And, and uh, you're absolutely right, we, we, we need pessimists as well to, to warn people, to say, okay, hey, have you thought about this and this? Just, or, just to ask questions. Sometimes you, sometimes you, I, I now people ask me questions and, and it's important because I say, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about it. So yeah, having discussions uh, of the whole society is, is super important, you're, you're right. It is super important. That's the purpose of this podcast to get awesome people like you on to discuss. We also like to look outside of outside of our experts industry. So because I think everyone's interested in interesting stuff as well. So outside of your outside of your day to day outside of what you're working on, what industries, technologies, etc, are you most excited about and why? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite impressed by autonomous cars, the progress that takes place there. It's it's going a bit faster than I thought. Even at some point, I, I think it will slow down um, uh, for for places like uh, uh, urban cities, which are, are really complex. If you if you see some of our old cities, which are really unstructured, I think their uh, autonomous car will, will take quite some time before being autonomous there. But I think on... It's moving faster than I thought for for let's say freeways or things like that. Where where I think we, the technology is is exciting and going fast. Um, um, yeah. What else? Um, Have you ridden in one? Sorry. Have you no. ridden an autonomous vehicle? No, no not yet. Uh, or well, yeah. Uh, no, in fact, not, not yet. No, 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 not, not. Uh, maybe, maybe on uh, no only um, shuttles. Shuttles, yes, small, small shuttles, airport things, or or in, at universities, but not yet a single car. Not, not yet. Um, would you do it? And would you close your eyes? Yeah, on a freeway, on a highway, yes, but not not on the general surface uh, in in cities. There, I would not trust yet uh, a, a car. I think we, especially if it's rainy, windy, things like that, where the lidar, the the, the cameras. I think you you have lots of trouble just in the perception side that 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 gets distracted. So there, I would not trust it uh, for quite some time. On yeah. the highway, I would be more, so, and especially if we start introducing communication between cars, I think uh, that opens many options to to streamline uh, the traffic and, and do good things. So there, yeah, that's one technology that comes to mind. It's moving nicely. Um, AI is doing well. I think the yeah the the, the yeah w one thing which I found quite impressive is is the reinforcement learning progress because so far I was not too impressed by deep learning because that for me was supervised learning. It's kind of technologies which were there already in the eighties and we just have better computers and, and it's nice, but we we now do better recognition of, of images things like that. So it, that's nice, but not too surprising. The more impressive things is when you start having reinforcement learning, so where the you don't have a supervisor, but you you learn just based on rewards. And what they did with AlphaGo, uh, playing Go and against itself and learning 
that that's quite impressive and that's what you need in robotics because in you also don't have for locomotion you don't have a supervisor for instance you you want to to do reinforcement learning you try things and then explore what's good and keep the good things um yeah so that could be a game changer if it works properly for robotics how do you think about the the forcing or the optimizing function so there's the example of the the, pa the paperclip optimizer if you have something that designs paperclips well the best way to create more paperclips is kill all of us and use our atoms to make more paperclips how do we optimize the how do we optimize that function so that we don't have either a rogue ai that's intelligent or not screw everything up Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I should think about it. Um, I, I, one thing I know that because all the field of optimal control and optimization is is now playing a big role in robotics. And interestingly, uh, before you had to hand tune your controller, so you had so you need some good insight about what the control is and what you have to do. And now, now you need good insight. You need creativity. Let's say in, in the objective function. So it goes a bit in what you said. You you. Uh, it becomes a bit more an art, like an artist uh, thinking, oh, I should play a bit with this objective function, this one, this one. Um, so it, that's that's an art. There's no meta mathematical framework to tell you how to specify objects, uh, objective functions. Now, I, 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 what I think you, you, yeah, just to come back to your question, you said, systems going rogue by, by having like very high level objective functions and finding strange way of optimizing uh, yeah yeah or just one that not even a strange way but let's say you optimize that you come up with certain functions if you come up with the wrong functions a it's hard to change and b if it's something that has unintended consequences yeah no that's worth monitoring yeah the um i'm not an expert but indeed you I, I see that a bit when we use evolutionary algorithms to to optimize our locomotion. Sometimes you you set the fitness function to I don't know move as fast as possible, and then the the whole algorithm find very strange way of solving the task that you had not thought about, or it uses tricks in the simulation environment that are not yeah that are really almost uh, mistakes, bugs in the the system that it it just takes benefits from. So you're right, that could happen. So it's important to monitor what type of solutions are being found by these optimizers or, or, or the AI and uh, and uh, maybe always have kind of a human in the loop um, somewhere as a supervisor, uh, every so often checking things. I think that the, the notion of human in loop should be there and, and, and should be some kind of supervising a bit what happens. 50 years from now, what would you say is the ratio of robotic devices and humans? Will it be one to one, 10 to one, one to five? How do you think about that? Yeah, the depends a bit what we call a robot because we, we start having many systems that will have sensing and acting and actuators and some kind of control loops. Uh, let's say, any, let's say anything that moves itself. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think one to one would be already a big number, and and um, we should not also see how to st sustain all, all these robots because you you need all the materials, you need the uh, electricity, you need so one to one, uh, so like a, a few billions robots would already be a good good thing. Uh, may, maybe one to five if you count very small devices doing small things um, and autonomous and, and, vehicles. Yeah, yeah, and 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 maybe. I'm also uh, like when you think at help at home. I, I'm I'm not so much into thinking we'll have a human aid robot servant that does everything. I I would rather see five robots being a bit more specific for specific purposes uh, rather than a single robot doing everything. Uh, I think it makes more sense. So so maybe uh, the one to five ratio at home or something might might be something mm -hmm. that comes to mind. Would love somebody to be cooking food for me and not having to think about that. You just have it all pre-prepared. That would be uh, that would be beautiful. I have uh, I have just a couple more questions. I know you're a super busy guy. Okay. Yeah. What are you most worried about these days? It can be a technology, a trend, a societal norm, anything. Yeah. Um... Well, this this military applica military application of robots and and uh, this difference of technology making uh, the war uh, a video game for for some of the countries that worries me um 
what worries me as well um yeah well oh yeah so yeah so, um, <laughs> Sometimes I feel we're getting a bit too egoistic. So, so uh, where, where everybody thinks about their own comfort, their own well-being, and, and forgetting a bit um, clear, close neighbors and, and, and countries far away, where, where like we, we are now discussing uh, nice things about technology, and I, I, I live my my kind of privileged life as a scientist, uh, academics in Switzerland. There are many places in the world where where what we're talking about will not make any sense. Where where, where the big priority is is finding a bit of food, water. Water is a worry in many places. So the well-being of many people, uh, yeah. Sometimes I feel a bit privileged uh, and and a bit. Um, uh, I feel privileged all the time, but I, I feel that we we don't think enough of of challenges of of that really concern humanity, and and there. Technology, uh, there we need simple technology. So we need like a, a solar oven or, or some simple way of cleaning water that is very far from this robotic thing we were discussing before. So not forgetting those very big needs of the big majority of people, I think is important. Yeah, I, and I should think more about it. I, I'm a bit in my dream of, of, of robots and everything, but there are sometimes more important problems to be solved for the whole humanity. The whole gratefulness thing that you brought up, I think, is one of those big problems as well. If people are just more grateful for what they have, we're all happier, we're all healthier, we all build better worlds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So if you had if you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything, something we haven't talked about yet, what would it be and why? Yeah, uh, well, what we just said is this notion of... Uh, being great, grateful for what we have, protect it and make sure we share it. So not keep it only for ourselves. I think that's very important. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, technology is great, but it's easy to get lost in technology. So the humanity is more important and, and the well-being of people is by far the most important thing. And technology should, should be at the service of that uh, and not the opposite. Yeah, optimize it, optimizing well-being and not GDP because GDP is not the right number. Now, one last one. If you had a if you had a magic wand, how would you get more kids and individuals interested and excited in pursuing robotics and STEM fields? Yeah, so so ro I think robots are wonderful for that. We we have many open days here at EPFL, and and uh, robots are a cool way of attracting. Also, girls. I have two daughters, so for me, it's important to attract girls to engineering, and and um, uh, yeah. So I think we need more robots in 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 schools, uh, primary schools. So so also a notion of computational thinking. So uh, to prepare our kids, we they, sh they should learn math and physics, but they are now should also learn what an algorithm is, and that's a specific way of thinking. So thinking in terms of algorithms that should be trained with ideally a robot and some programming uh, problems very early on. And I, th I think that that will help a lot our um, next generation of, of, of engineers. Plus, it would be so much more fun than most classes. You get to build a robot. I know those were my favorite days in college. We're building robots and competing with other students. I think uh, I think that would be a great way to get kids excited about interesting and relevant f uh, fields and futures. Okay, I've had you on here for a while. I know you're a busy guy, and you gotta you gotta get back to work. Where is the best place for people to find you, connect with you, and then learn a little bit more about what you do? Yeah. So, well, first of all, please check the my the website of my lab. So, biorobotics at EPFL. Uh, if you type biorob uh, EPFL, you will find it. Uh, we we have a Twitter link. We're not very active, but we we send out a bit uh, news items and and things coming out of the lab and uh yeah people can send me an email if they i, I have a bit difficulties i think like most people to answer emails but if if I, i'm trying to so uh, people can send me an email as well and people can find it on my uh, the lab website and if you guys are interested in this check out the ted talk that Alke did something like two million views very uh it's people love robots it's incredibly interesting exciting thanks for coming on today it's been a fun one was well, great as well yeah thanks a lot for inviting me yeah yeah, of course. It was uh, it was awesome. And the who doesn't love robots? If you guys enjoyed this, disruptors.fm. Make sure you subscribe. All the major podcasting apps, just the disruptor search for us. You should find us there. If not, check out the site and you can get the links. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Alker. You're most welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah. Cheers, guys.